Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much to Ahmed Bauer for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my research to you. What I want to do is actually present this more as a formal paper uh, because of our time constraints. The movement in education studies today is not towards cultivating creative silence, but rather towards active, language-rich learning and teaching environments. In education, silent moments are frequently perceived as obstacles inhibiting the flow of teacher-student conversation. The operation of silence and slow time is frequently subtle and difficult to capture and measure precisely. And this is why it has received only slight attention in the scholarship of teaching and learning until recently. My study initially asked, does silence and slow time have a place in current teaching and learning discourse? Now this question is, can pause moments help make disciplinarians more intentional in their praxis? I first became intrigued by the emancipatory power of silence in education in an essay entitled Fruit of Silence by American writer and teacher Marilyn Nelson, which had been published in the Teachers College Record in 2006. Nelson enfolds silence within a discourse of contemplative pedagogy in scaffolding the teaching of a literature course to officer cadets at West Point Military Academy. Her case study follows the officers during their deployment to Iraq during the Second Gulf War. Through letter correspondence, two former West Point cadets described to Nelson how they used silence as a tool to centre themselves in times of anxiety while on campaign in a theatre of war. As officers, both related how they had positively integrated silence as a coping mechanism, as for instance, when one of their soldiers was killed or when soldiers had been wounded, and they were expected as officers to show composure before their uh, troops. Their composure had an incidental, yet not inconsequential, role in peacekeeping within a Kurdish village, and very much in response to their act of restraint. In her study, Nelson aims to transform attitudes. Silence is practiced as a tool to promote reflection, what Nelson describes as musings, in order to encourage the development of more sensitive awareness, Nelson's metaphorical fruit of silence. A feature of the literature on silence is its rich multidisciplinary aspect. Studies on different types of silence include visual and spatial silence, as well as relationships between silence, noise and sound. The value of recent scholarship has been to demonstrate how closely silence is bound up with other modes of communication, oral, written, visual and musical, making it a potentially powerful communication tool. Recent studies on silence are bound up with perceptions of time. The most beneficial studies on silence are those that have taken a phenomenological approach. Silence can make listening and viewing more sensitive. And in this sense, silence is not an absence, but rather a powerful presence. The role of silence in higher education is still under-theorised and under-researched. Paul Armstrong has suggested that this lack is due in part to a difficulty in assigning precise meanings to silence, as any analysis is contingent on particular social and cultural locations, or place and space. Speaking to the phenomenological nature of silence. Early educational studies 
focused on the use of silence in creative writing classes as seen through small, limited individual case studies. Ros Allen, in 2008, has presented a comprehensive study on the pedagogy of silence, which formed the theoretical basis of my own study. Allen built on the pioneering work of Adam Jarowski, who indicated the richness and complexity of multidisciplinary approaches for understanding silence, which included psycholinguistic, paralinguistic, ethnographic, semiotic, pragmatic, educational, literary, and philosophical approaches. Jarowski crucially contends that silence is an extremely powerful communication tool. Allen is among the first scholars to assign precise meanings to silence in education, what she terms as silent pedagogy. Her paradigm captures those subtle and complex aspects of teaching and learning enactments which have been marginalized or ignored, or ignored because of difficulties in observing practice. Allen's paradigm has successfully moved discussions forward by considering a wider presentation of silence as not simply quietness or absence of sound, but as a diverse range of tools fostering reflective opportunities for teaching and learning. Allen has tabulated observed multimodal silences to include visual silence, spatial silence, kinesthetics, reading and writing. So now I want to move on to my own case study. The challenge and focus of my research was to test Ros Allen's paradigm within a phenomenological context from the positions of both students and teachers. Initially, this took place between October 2008 to April 2009, when 88 part-time adult education students and five tutors performed aspects of Ollen's paradigm in lecture halls and gallery spaces. This sample group comprised adult learners on the evening diploma in European art history, based here uh, in University College Cork in the Centre for Adult and Continuing Education, and two daytime art history short courses here in UCC, and also based in the Cork City Library. It was decided during the year to slow down the activity of looking in order to fo focus on the process of thinking and writing about images. Silence and slow time interventions were distilled into a slow looking rubric, which was then adopted um, from Ollen's model. And this is the, the paradigm, this is the rubric, which I'll discuss uh, in, in a moment. So as you can see, what I've done here is I've taken um, Ollen's uh, wider uh, paradigm where she's looking at the processes of mapping time and silence within teacher and student discourse. And I've apply applied it to the way in which a student might approach a visual image as a, as a documentary text. So the first level is that of the literal captioning, the type of questions that you would ask of that uh, are tagged to the image, uh, which you will find, for example, in a caption uh, within a book. But the second element, which is the discursive, the aspect of seeing, involves the student trusting their own description of the image. So actually looking at that image and trusting themselves to describe what it is they see. In most cases within visual studies, this is not what students do. What they tend to do is they tend to jump to the critical or contextual meaning before taking that second step. And what I'm arguing is that second step, that um, descriptive mode, is crucial 
in order to approach a more critical and then finally uh, contextual meaning in order to build up a complete analytical analysis of the image as a visual document. The power of this in terms of integrative learning and teaching, and indeed Becky was my supervisor on this, and my work uh, at the moment is beginning to look at this within the context of integrative learning and teaching, I think you could apply this type of rubric to looking at texts, um, looking at music, and any other type of documentary source that you need to engage in a form of critical analysis, which is systematic and can be made public and made visible for both students and teachers. Once students knew how to look, what questions to ask about an image, then it was hoped that they would be able to transfer their critical skills to other images and other contexts. This slow-looking paradigm was assessed by introducing creative forms of assessment where students were asked to periodically review their personal map or metaphor of art history by reflecting on how this was changing in response to appropriating new information and conceptual frameworks. Patterns of learning are modelled on modes of teaching. Imitation or mimesis initially plays a role in learning a new discipline. Olin's observations on silence were essential in establishing a framework for practice. Graduate teaching assistants were invited to make silent and slow time interventions in the curriculum through pause moments and to reflect on their enactments. Tutors were encouraged to reflect on their intervention using Olin's paradigm. To Olin, silent visual representation enables students to engage in creative activity without the need for a vocalizing performance, which might tend to steer them towards producing what was conventionally accepted. So she describes this as a creative, silent space. She sees this as presenting an opportunity to take a fresh look at an idea or an issue. Such interventions needed to be embedded within all aspects of the curriculum, especially the assessment process, to have any real impact. In this respect, the assessment where I was asking students to map uh, or present metaphors of the discipline was important in fostering among students a reflective approach to the study of the discipline, allowing for the appropriation of critical visual skills. Enacting silent interventions requires awareness as a teacher who explores his or her contemplative mind is better able to help his or her students to do the same. The psychological effects of silence are grounded in attitude, environment and intention. The revealing or concealing of intention and duration can greatly determine how silence is received. For a silent intervention to be positively incorporated within a curriculum, then the reason, the purpose and the duration of the intervention needs to be clearly announced to students and appraised periodically by staff. Tutors initially struggled with silent and slow time interventions because they were attempting to slot these interventions into a transmission model of teaching. This was a style that they were reproducing, implicitly learnt from their own experiences of lectures as undergraduates. However, once they were encouraged to experiment with different approaches, allowing interventions to occur spontaneously, within a transformative model of teaching and learning, they found that these interventions arose more naturally, helping to establish an underlying structure to their sessions. Initially, slow-looking interventions gave the class space to see, time to look, and it transformed their engagement with the works they studied. 
Seeing with new eyes was the most frequent metaphorical response given by the class when asked to articulate their individual transformations throughout an academic year. However, considered longitudinally over a five-year period between 2009 and 2014, one may argue that while the slow-looking scaffold was initially beneficial, over time there was a tendency for students to rely on the scaffold as a mnemonic device. As a result, there was a continuing onus on the teaching team to reimagine the application of the slow-looking scaffold so that it remained dynamic. Through their imaginative engagements, tutors began to see the value of limiting curriculum content so that more time could be devoted to modelling critical visual analysis. So now I wish to conclude. Intentional critical analysis, fostered through either text or image, negates the necessity for coverage. An implication of this integrative step is that it encourages pruning back curriculum content so that teachers might devote more time to making explicit the processes underlying disciplinary practices. If holistic approaches to learning continue to gain acceptance, then silence and slow time may yet play a significant role in 21st century teaching and learning. Thank you.